Namadwa ma buana, kwa hili lainoa, jia yangu hu ningizia. Nikamri di sha, atanda du mi sha, ta meni uti pia. A meni uti, jia pweke nihi, ya faraha kwa yesu, a meni ukati. You know that song? Oh, you guys know Swahili. Awesome. <laughs> Trust and obey. There is no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust him and obey. I learned that at a very young age in a small country church in South Dakota. In South Dakota. Felt like God was calling me to be a pastor's wife. Met Don at Mid-American Nazarene University. Yay. And... Um, he went to Southern Nazarene later. But anyway, uh, went, to, went there and um, met Don. And at that time, he was preparing for ministry. He hadn't really decided which ministry, but I knew it was going to be a pastor. So I just, um, we went forward with our plans and got married and started our family. And we had two girls, and he went on a work and witness tip trip. And when he was on that work and witness trip, he, had, he felt strongly the call to missions. Now, he was trying all the ministry hats on. Should I be a pastor, evangelist, youth pastor? You know, he's trying all the hats on. But when he went on that work and witness trip and felt God calling him to be a missionary, he felt very strong. This is what I need to do. And he said yes to the Lord. But he kind of told the Lord, he says, but you need to call Evie too. You know, she needs to hear that same calling. And that even is what headquarters will say. Both, both spouses have to have the same calling. But um, he came home and I sensed that he had a call to missions. He was still now at Bethany, um, Nazarene University, Southern Nazarene now. And um, I thought, no, this is just like one of those camp highs. You know, you come home, feel all good, you know, and he'll come back to normal. He's going to be a pastor, right? And about a year went by. The Lord just worked on my heart little by little. And um, one Sunday morning at Lake Overholsha Church in Nazarene, Bethany, Oklahoma, the pastor was speaking about doing God's will. And he asked us to ask ourselves two questions. I'll ask you to ask yourself the same questions. Are you in the center of God's will? Are you following God's will for your life? And when I looked inside, I knew I had to say yes to the mission call. So I went forward that morning and just, you know, not big emotions or anything, but just went forward and said, Lord, if this is what you want of my life, if you want me to be a missionary, I know that you'll go with me. And that's what he does. He never asks us to do anything that he doesn't go along with us. And so I knelt there that morning and told him that, and a peace just descended over me. Well, Don had told the Lord, you have to call Abby. I'm not going to mention it. So he had not mentioned it this whole year. And on the way home that morning, I turned to Don. I said, okay, Don, we can start preparation for mission service. So he's driving and looking at me. I said, eh, watch the road as well, you know. But he is so surprised that, um, you know, it took a year, but God finally got through to me. And um, headquarters told us, get his ordination. We were or ordained on the Nazarene, I mean, on the Arizona district. And um, by this time now, we had three girls and we thought we were at a mission field. We were at Twin Wells Indian School, Sun Valley Indian School, Native American Christian Academy now, keeps changing names. And we thought, hey, this is a mission field. I was so worried about, you know, going to the mission field, the unknown, um, living in a grass hut. We don't. Um, separation from family. That was one of my concerns as well. And... One of the biggest is, I just didn't feel worthy. But again, that last night pastor used this phrase that I use a lot. My availability gives God the opportunity to work a miracle through me. I was taught that as well. And I was like, 
I need to be available. And so um, we went to headquarters, and they said, okay, get all these things done. And we were at Twin Wells, and we were, hey, this is great. We're just here to stay. My mom and dad even moved down there. So family was right there with our, our grandparents, were right there for our grandchildren. And we just thought this was where God was putting us on the mission field. Three years later, we went to um, General Assembly, and um, during the mission service, the emphasis at night, a long prayer by Louise Marie Chapman, God started speaking to us again about overseas missions. And we both were like, well, we're on a mission field. You know, can't we just stay where we're at? But he asked us to trust him. He asked us to obey. So we said yes to missions, um, got interviewed. I mean, went to mission um, people, got interviewed, and they asked us, do you have a particular call to a particular place? Well, Don had building experience, and we thought we had been talking about, and he also spoke some Spanish. Don't try him now, though. Um, and we thought we were going to go to a Spanish-speaking country and do work and witness because of his experience. And so we told the officials, we're saying, no, we really don't fill a specific call um, wherever you would like to place this. But I spoke up. I remember it as clear as day. And I said, I don't think we're supposed to go to Africa. They must have wrote Africa and forgot the no. So when they announced that Donna and Abby were going to Malawi, they didn't put Africa on the end of it. They just said, Donna and Abby are commissioned to serve in Malawi. And this is where they told you in front of a whole bunch of people. You didn't get told ahead of time. And Don turns to me. We're sitting at a banquet table type place. And he goes, where is that? They didn't say Maui. <laughs> it, well, I was dumbfounded. I had worked in the um, work and witness office and headquarters, so I knew where Malawi was. And I said, it's in Africa. They, they've, they've messed up. They, they, they confused us with someone else. And we were dumbfounded. We went to the Lord and, Lord, is this right? Are we supposed to go to Africa? Are we supposed to take our girls at that time, 6, 10, and 12, and go to Africa? No, we can't do that. Trust and obey. We knew that was what God wanted us to do. So that's almost been, that was 1990, 30 years ago. We went to the mission field. 11 years we were in Malawi, knew the language. Work was going well in our comfort zone. They come to Don and say, we'd like for you to consider moving to Kenya and taking the job of the field strategy coordinator and living in Nairobi. And we're like, no thanks. We're not interested. We had been to Nairobi on a couple trips because our girls had gone to boarding school. Um, I homeschooled them up through about junior high, and then they go off to boarding school. And Three, year, three months they would be there, one month home. And just occasionally, Don and I got to fly up and go out to their school and be with them. But when we would land in Nairobi, we're like, whew, we're so glad we don't live here. The traffic was terrible, and you know, it was a lot, a lot of trash at the time, and communication was really bad at that time. And so we were just like, no, we're happy that we're in quiet Malawi. So then, um, they asked, us, asked Don to take that position, and we said, no, thanks. But um, again, they said, well, give us some prayer. Ask God if it's his will. And so we were like, hmm, we can pray about it, but we know where we're supposed to be. You know, we just didn't really think that this was going to be God's will at all. But sure enough, he impressed on our hearts that that is what he wanted us to do, is to move to Kenya and take on this field strategy coordinator position, which covers so much territory. But again, we trusted him. He leads. He gives us power. He gives us strength. So we've been there now for, what, almost 20 years, and God has just blessed us. There's been many programs that he has brought our way. Um, one day I was walking through Don's office, and 
his assistant at that time had a four inch notebook and he was thumbing through it. And I said, what is, you know, what's that? He goes, you should look at this. And I was like, well, I don't have time to look at that book, but what's it about? And um, he says, this is our orphan and vulnerable children program that Nazarene Compassionate Ministries has been asked to help. I said, whoa, that looks like a big project. He says, it is. I don't know who is going to do this. The Holy Spirit just spoke to me. You're going to do it. I was like, I'm not telling anybody that I just heard from the Holy Spirit. And I just decided, no, <laughs> I'm not going to do this. Um, but as I thought, no, I don't have any experience in, in grant leading and stuff like that. And so, but sure enough, the Lord had me do that. It was such a rewarding program. We had served over 10,000 we call them OVC in short, orphans and vulnerable children over about eight year period. And some of the centers, we made them income generating um, centers and caregivers, and there's some of them, most, all of them are still going to some degree. So again, just when God calls us to do something, we have to trust him, we have to obey. There's been many things that we can tell you about how trust and obey and how we need to put that into our lives. Um, you know the famous verse from Proverbs 3, 5. This morning, again, thought of it. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will make your paths straight. I wrote that, 214. I mean, I, I highlighted it, wrote the date, 2.14, when Don was going to the oncologist. We don't know what the future holds. There's a song like that, but we know who holds the future. But we trust God. We obey. Even in this, you know, crisis that we're coming into right now, we trust God and obey. Your faith promise. The pastor's always already said, you know, you're, you're supporting the missionaries in 160-plus world areas. Our area is growing by leaps and bounds. We have lots of nationals that are taking over the, the jobs, and we really appreciate um, that. And, but God is growing his church. And your giving helps to keep missionaries and the mission work there. So as you think about what God is laying on your heart to trust him, please obey, and your blessings will be there. I remember when I was a teenager, I'm going to challenge some of the teenagers. Um, I, in my small town church where I grew up in South Dakota, felt the Lord impress me to do Faith Promise. So I have been involved in Faith Promise ever since I've been like 14 or 15 years old. Even through being a missionary, God still talks to us about Faith Promise. So trusting God and obeying is the only way. With your life, with circumstances, that are going around us because he is the only way. Please trust and obey. We have a lot of ministries in, in East Africa. We cover a large territory, like Evie said. Uh, we oversee 12 countries and um, 37 districts. And we have uh, churches all the way from large congregations and buildings almost, almost this big. Uh, and um, we also have underground churches where people worship in homes in secret where nobody can see them and and if I had time I would tell you how some of those work where it takes uh, I, I went to visit one one time where they came in uh, they took us to a place that um, uh, they said we need to be there by eight o'clock in the morning on a Sunday morning actually it was on a Wednesday morning and so on Wednesday morning, we went to the, there at 8 o'clock in the morning, and there was just the pastor. It was an apartment. It was, there was a pastor there. And, um, and his wife and family, we had a cup of tea, and we ended, enjoyed having a small breakfast with them. And then after about an hour or 45 minutes, some other people came in. And it took about four hours before everyone was there to meet in that small underground house church because they come one or two at a time. And once everybody was there, we had a worship service. And I don't know if you've, if you've ever, uh, you know, a worship team like this, it's impossible. 
And when they said they're going to sing a song, they'll whisper a song. And I can't carry a tune in a whisper. Uh, at least I can't hear it. And we worshiped for a little while, and then the pastor uh, asked me to share a message. And when I shared the message, the missionary that had taken me there said, Now, Rev, we're in an apartment building. Don't get too excited. And so I'm trying to figure out how do you preach a message on the wondrous holiness of God doing miracles in people's lives and not get excited about it. And he said to me, he said, just keep, keep it down, a little quiet. And so I did my best, and, uh, and God moved on the people. And then when we got done with the worship service and we had a prayer time together and a, and a, a couple of young men had had knelt down to to be baptized with the holy spirit and and you know they wanted to be entirely sanctified and we prayed with them and helped them to pray through and then after the service was done and they they got up and people started leaving one at a time i mean it's almost it's almost like being the last people out of the church building for Nazarenes, you know, you're, we stayed around, and so eight hours later, we left the pastor's house. We had been there at his house for nearly eight, eight hours, and uh, went back to the hotel where we were staying. And then our missionary tells me, "Now, oh, Rev. Don, this is how the underground church operates." And he said, "If anybody would have followed us there," he said, "because you're an American, a white guy coming into." This apartment complex, if anyone would have followed us there, the whole group of people would have been at risk. And so we had, that's one of the reasons we went there early, uh, because we were hoping most people would you know, either be gone for work or, or, or not awake yet. <laughs> we didn't know what was going to happen. But we have all kinds of different ministries like that at, in the Church of the Nazarene on the mission field, and particularly in East Africa. One of the larger things Evie mentioned was uh, Nazarene Compassionate Ministries and we were selected, Nazarene Compassionate Ministries was selected by a consortium in Kenya and by USAID to, to do a food relief and uh, in, in the certain areas of Kenya we were in the midst of a drought that had been going on for five years and this drought had been so bad that in the area that we were assigned people had begun to mix sand with their cornmeal when they boiled it so they would feel that they had something in their stomach and we were assigned to this area and I drove down there with a couple of our people who work with I uh, work with we have an NCM coordinator for the entire field and we went down to that area to look for the chief because in Africa when you do any kind of ministry like that or even showing the Jesus film or doing something that is public in his area you need to get permission from the chief. In fact, what we do is we try to do more than just get permission. We want the chief to be involved in what we're doing. And so we drove to this area to find the chief, and we asked around and different people and said, well, you know, he should be over here. No, maybe he's over there. No, but he's probably on this side. And we didn't find him. And so um, we had talked with a couple of the elders of the area that are part of the chief's council. And uh, they told us, well, you know, maybe you'll find him if, you, if you're driving back towards town or what. So we got it back in the car and headed back towards Nairobi. And we saw this guy in a chief's uniform staggering down the ditch. He had been drinking. And we stopped and I asked, are you Chief Kimurgo? Chief John? And he walked over to us and breathed on me <laughs> and said, yes, my name is John. I'm chief of this area. And I said, well, in my mind, I'm thinking, this guy's never going to understand why we're here. But I said to him, can we come back next week, like on Tuesday? We want to talk with you because we have been, we have been assigned to this area to bring food relief to your people. His eyes kind of brightened up, and he said, Oh, yes, I'll be, I'll be ready for you. You're, you're welcome to come. And so we, we came, we, we left, and we had other appointments to take care of, and we went back on Tuesday, and we found the chief at his home. He was still drunk, or drunk again, and we, we, we 
we drove up to his place, and when we got out of the, the car, we saw that he had some chairs sitting underneath the trees uh, next, next to his house, and he had prepared a tea for us. And all, you know, he, he served tea every time we went to visit this guy, and I'm, I'm a coffee guy. And to me, tea is just like drinking dirty water. I mean, sorry, tea people. But um, <laughs> it, just, it just doesn't taste like coffee. And, <laughs> and so we had our cup of tea, and, and the village elders were there together with him, and we shared with them that what we, we have been assigned to this area to bring food relief. We have, we have funding to bring food for 700 families every month, a month's supply of food every month for 700 families, and this was for, at that time for a year. Uh, and so uh, we, they, they were excited, and we worked out a way with them. That we wanted them to identify those families who were most in need. And we uh, helped them to set up these little cards that each family would get a card, and they had the dates for distribution on those cards. And every time they would bring those cards, we would punch that date out and, and, you know, and, and, and distribute the food. And, and things were going well, and the, the, the food distributions were starting to move along. And Chief Kimorgo, uh, Chief John, I'll use his e easier name, Chief John came to me, and he said, he said Rev, I want to know more about your church. He said, no one has ever come and served my people the way you people have served us. And I want to know more about your church. And he said, do you have any literature, anything I can read? And I said, no, we don't give literature away for free. I'm kidding. I didn't say that. I said, <laughs> I said yes, here, here is something to, you know, what we did was we gave him Chick Shaver's eight basic Bible studies for the new Christian. He's not even a Christian. And he began to study these uh, together with Job. Job Odanga is my, kind of my right-hand guy. That I, he, he was much involved in this project. And, and he, he would call Job on the phone and say, what is this supposed to mean? Can you explain this scripture to me? And so, you know, once a week, Job would meet with him for eight weeks. And, and you know, it was just incredible. The guy was so eager to learn. He called me one day when I was in Nairobi. And he said, Rev... I need you to come down to Waso Miro. That's his area. I need you to come down because I need to share something with you. And I thought, oh man, what's gone wrong with the feeding program? And uh, I drove down to his place, and he took us under the trees, and we had another cup of tea. And and then, you know, he's, he he says after we drank the tea, and he he stood up and he says, "Follow me." Well, when the chief says, "Stand up and follow me," you stand up. And follow the chief. And so I followed him, and he walked out a little distance of three or four hundred yards from his house, and he says, he said, and he actually stopped on this old slab of concrete that was there, and he stood on that, and he said, there used to be a church here. And he said, I, uh, I want you to stand on this slab. And he said, watch me. And he started walking. And I'm standing on his slab, and he's getting further and further away, and he stops, and he says, Can you see me over here? And I said, Yeah, I can see you. And he turns, and he walks down the hill towards the river, and starts. he just keeps going down. And I'm thinking, What is this guy doing? He stops down there, and he says, Can you see where I'm at here? I said, Yes, I can see you. And he stuck a stick in the ground at these two places, and then he made like a big square walking like that. Then he walked back and stood with me on the slab, and he says, put his hands on my shoulder and says, Rev Don, I want to donate this land to the Church of the Nazarene. I want your church in my community. And he actually went and he paid all of the land transfer fees and everything like that. And, and I have a photograph of, of when he presented that document, uh, the, the land deed to us that it belongs to the Church of the Nazarene. Five and a half acres. And I'm wondering, what are we going to do with five and a half acres out in the middle of Maasai land? And Maasai is the tra to tribe. And yet, <laughs> I, 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 I just didn't have any idea what God was going to do with this. And so we thanked him for it, you know, and, and now we... I had our, our zone leader for that area, one of our ordained elders, to start 
working with in that area to, to plant a church and he and they had this there was this big candelabra tree I don't know if you it's a cactus kind of thing and uh, right in the middle of our land and they started having worship services under this candelabra tree and and Chief John started going to those and uh, about that time Evie and I had come back to the US we're in the US nearly every year and uh, sometimes twice a year and we had come back to the United States and we were on on furlough or uh, home assignment and uh, every time we come to the US we usually wind up I shouldn't say usually it's always we always wind up sometime going into this gigantic store that has this big blue sign with white letters and um, you know Walmart and um, you know Evie loves to shop for the grandkids that we have over in Kenya and and I love to watch people if you want some entertainment go to Walmart and you can watch people and it is really a lot of fun and so I walking walking around through the store and and my phone rings so I took my phone out of my pocket and I see Chief John uh, he's calling me from Kenya and so I uh, I answered and I said hey chief how's it going he said Rev Don he said I just want you to know it's going really well and, I, and I'm thinking when he called me you know I'm thinking there's something wrong with the feeding program again or something crazy is happening and he said I, I just wanted to I just wanted to let you know he said this morning I went to Pastor Richard's Church of the Nazarene over here it's about eight kilometers from where he lives he said I went to Pastor Richard's church my wife Viola and my kids went with me he said I want you to know that I received I accept Jesus Christ as my personal Savior after he preached a message about being saved I understood and I said wow chief this is wonderful I'm so excited that that this has happened I, as soon as we get back to Kenya we weren't very many days away from our departure back to Kenya and I said as soon as I get back to Kenya I want to come to your place and see you and and, and to hear your story and uh, we got back and went to his place and we sat under the trees and had another cup of tea and and we had a nice conversation he shared with me about the big change that had taken place in his in his life and Viola was there his wife and she's she said you know I, I wasn't believing that he had really gotten saved and but he's a different man now Amen. you see Chief John used to be a very troublesome man he used to he used to create problems among his people so that he could rule them easier you know divide and conquer sort of deal and and uh, she said he's not like that anymore she said there's something different or he's changed and 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 she had she returned home to him with the children because he had changed and we had a working witness team come to Kenya from Detroit and uh, that team came and they were working on another project somewhere and I shared with them how this chief when he wasn't even a Christian, this chief had, share, had given us a piece of land for a church building, for, for us to have plant a church. And the pastor of the, of the Detroit team was, that, was on the team, and he said, can we go see this guy? I want to go see that place. And so we just jumped in a vehicle, and we drove down to that place, where, to John's place, and where that slab was still sitting there. And, and we, we, we drove, because I knew he needed to, I, I needed to introduce him to the chief, because you go into an area, you have to talk to the chief. We introduced him to the chief, to Chief John, and, and we had another cup of tea. And then we went out to the, to the slab, and, we, and, and Chief John says, I want, you to, I want you to see this place, how big it is. And he had sent somebody to each of the corners. So we could see how big the place is. And the pastor that was with us, uh, Pastor Ben, he's, he's, he just couldn't believe. He said, this guy gave this to you, whispering to me, this guy gave this to you and he wasn't even a Christian? And I said, no, he didn't give it to me, he gave it to the church. <laughs> and, he, and anyway, he said, well, let's, let's dedicate this place for the Lord, for the work of God. And we all held hands and, and we prayed together on that slab that God would use that piece of property to win men and women to Jesus Christ and young people to the Lord. And uh, so they came back and they started, they built a building. You'll see, a, you'll see that building in, in the video that we're, we're going to show in a little bit. And um, you'll even see the candelabra tree where the church started. And, and we'll be able to sh share with you some of the things that had happened. It's in the video. But, um, 
you know, it, we had such a wonderful response with, from that team when they came and they, they built that building. Even the chief, the, the chief took off his uniform and, and put on what they call shamba clothing. That's clothing that they wear in their, in their, when they're working in their gardens. A shamba is a garden. And so he put on his shamba clothes and was helping to mix concrete for this church as the church was being built. About a year later, and the, the, the feeding program is still continuing, well, I, I, Chief John did say to me, he said, I want to say thank you to the Church of the Nazarene. He said, because the way we normally end up getting food relief is that they will come with this big long truck and the, the bags of corn or, or maize are piled up on this truck. He said, I as chief won't even know when they're supposed to come. They just show up and start driving through the community and roll the corn off on the sides, these bags of maize, and just keep on driving. And he said, my people would run for a bag of maize and they'll fight over a bag of maize. Even people have died fighting over food. He said, but the Church of the Nazarene has given us, you have given my people dignity. And we watched the distribution. They would come in and pick up their food and go outside the fence to, because we were using the, the, the chief's uh, 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 housing area where that was fenced off. They would go outside the fence and set their food down and share it with other neighbors who hadn't received. And in Africa, the old Africa is that when you see someone in need, you help them with part of what you have, even if what you have is very little. And so the chief had shared that with me. And, and it, but as I was saying, the, the second year had gone by, and Navi and I were back here in the United States again. And somehow we wound up in that store with the blue sign. And, and I'm wandering around, and, and I, 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 I kind of like tools, you know. And, and I was standing in the tool aisle, and um, I was looking at this cordless drill. And, you know, I'm kind of like Tim the Tool Man. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm thinking, I'd sure like to get this back to Kenya. This would be nice for me to, you know, in my little shop and, and work and witness and trying to, if I had this, I could help the work and witness guys and, you know, justify it. And I'm looking at this and my phone rings. So I took the phone out of my pocket and, yeah, you guessed it, it was Chief John. And uh, so I, I, I handed the phone back, I handed the phone, handed the drill back to the guy who was, the salesman who was trying to sell it to me, and I answered my phone and said, hey, Chief John, how are you? I said, uh, I hope things are going well, and he said, Rev, he says, I am, I am doing very well. He said, the feeding program is doing very well. He said, I just want you to know that, you know, I, I have went to Pastor Richard's church, and our, our zone leader preached a message on sanct entire sanctification. He said, I get it. I want you to know that I got entirely sanctified on Sunday. And, and I'm, I'm in Walmart. Woo! Now I'm one of them. And that, the salesman looks at me, puts a drill down, and walks away. <laughs> and I, I'm just praising the Lord because Chief John had gotten entirely sanctified. And, and, I've, and I just told him, I said, John, I'm so happy for you. I praise the Lord for what's going on. And, you know, I don't know who's listening, but I don't care. And, and I, I said, I, I want to come and see you as soon as I get back. He, and, you know, I was trying to kind of cut the conversation short because I knew it was costing him money. And, and he says, wait, wait, Rev. Rev Don, don't hang up. He said, I have a question. I said, okay. Uh, shoot, what's the question? He said, you know, I'm just wondering, can you, can you help me? He said, can you explain to me, how do you become a pastor in the Church of the Nazarene? God is calling me to be a pastor. <laughs> and I told him, John, I don't have time to tell you. You don't have enough money on your phone for me to tell you how to become a pastor in the Church of the Nazarene. I said, let me put you in touch with the district superintendent and with your zone leader. And I'll ask them to explain the process of education and going through the process of becoming a pastor in the church of the Nazarene. I tell you, I said, when I get back to Kenya, I want to come and see you. Please don't make any more tea. No, I didn't say that. 
But I, I, went to, I went to his place, and we did have another cup of tea. And he shared with me the joy of his salvation and the joy of being entirely sanctified. I'm telling you, that man had changed. He was filled with the Holy Spirit. And, and you know, even his wife, Viola, was sitting there, and she was just raising her hand and clapping while he's telling me his story of being entirely sanctified. And the witness that he had in the community totally changed. And I, as I, I visited with him for a little while and, and prayed with him and gave him some more instruction on the way to become a pastor. And, and, and as I was leaving his place, he lives about a mile off of the main highway. And, and I drove up to the main highway and stopped because there was traffic. It's always a good idea to stop if there's traffic. You know. And I stopped to wait for the traffic to go by. And while I'm stopped there, there was a knock on my window. And you have to understand, I'm, I'm sitting on the other side of the car now, over there. And there's a knock on the passenger side window. And I rolled the window down and looked, and there's one of the elders, the village elders. An old guy that always wears his floppy hat, and he has Coke bottle thick glasses, you know, and, and the, just kind of wobbly on a, on, on, a, on a walking stick. And he leans down, and he says, Rev Don. I said, oh, hi, William, how are you? He said, Rev, I want to know, what have you done to our chief? And I said, I didn't, what, what, what do you mean? I, I haven't done anything to the chief. And he said, no, 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 he's not the same man he used to be. He used to always create fights and trouble. He said, now he's the one, when we have meetings, he's the one that is asked to pray. What have you done to him? And I said, no, it's not me, it's Jesus who has done something to change his heart. And William looked at me and goes, Oh, Jesus, huh? <laughs> I think it's the last he wanted to hear. But uh, Chief John is now pastoring that church, which is about 400 yards from his house. And we call him Pastor Chief John <laughs> because he's still a chief. And uh, his, his family is very much involved and, and the church is growing. And, and uh, in fact, I, I received a phone call from him once uh, as Evie and I were planning to leave uh, to come to the States. And, and he called me the day before and he said, I just wanted, you to, I just wanted to talk to you before you flew out. He said, I, I wanted to pray with you. And I, I could hear all this noise in the background and, and uh, people singing and, and, you know, I could tell it was Maasai music and, and, and uh, singing in the background and everything. And I said, John, where are you? He said, uh, oh, he said, you know, I, I wish, I'm just at the church. I'm outside of the church here, he said, that, but I felt like the Lord really wanted me to pray for you. So he, he prayed for me. And after he got done praying, I said, John, what's going on? And he said, well... We're having a revival service here at the church, and, and he, uh, he said, uh, there's nearly 300 people here. And he said, uh, I, you know, I said, well, praise the Lord. He, he said, and these people, they really want to know Jesus, and they really are interested in, in this Nazarene thing with holiness. <laughs> and it was not really Nazarene. Well, it came from the Nazarene. But I want to know this holiness thing. And, and then after he prayed for me, you know, people, it, it, it's interesting when, when, when people that you have been praying for turn the tables on you and pray for you, it really means something. I got a text from John a couple of days ago, and he asked me, he said, Rev, how's your health? He says, I've been praying for you. I want you to know that my church has set aside a day of prayer to pray for you. And he said, we are expecting you to come back fully healed Amen. and to continue to minister to us. And what that does to me to know that those I prayed for, I still pray for, have turned around and are now praying for me. 
there's something about being in the family of God that is a true family that cares for one another just as you folks have been caring for Evie and me in our circumstances here where when when we pray together we know that God is there and he is with us and Paul said in the book of Ephesians for this reason I bow my knees before the Father from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory just imagine according to the riches of his glory imagine the riches of his glory beyond imagination to be strengthened with power through his spirit where in the inner man and we're talking about entire sanctification to be strengthened with his power through his spirit in the inner man so that Christ may dwell in your heart through faith and that you being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all of the saints what is the breadth and the length and the height and the depth and to know the love of Christ which surpasses knowledge now catch this next phrase that you may be filled up with a little bit of the fullness of God <laughs> no it says that you may be filled up to all the fullness of God and when I see men and women's lives change like Chief John and his wife Viola to see their children come into the kingdom as a matter of fact, Chief John has seven young people in his church that he is mentoring into ministry that have, that have testified that God has called them to be preachers of the gospel, to be ministers of the gospel in some respect, even including his son and his daughter. They are all wanting to serve the Lord, and John is discipling them. He puts them up front and gets them to preach. He puts them, teach, takes them out and teaches them how to call on families. And God is doing some miraculous things. It's my desire, my greatest desire, is to see God's people overcome with his Holy Spirit. We'll watch the little video. Father, teach us how. 